Okay. Okay, so we're ready to start. Uh, yes, we are. Kapoi. Okay, here Karakia Tato Ami Noi Tato. Your Matu, uh, your Matu, Matu, Kitarangi. Now we hang like Tirangi Mitifin with Tamanui Tera Temahana Yamata. We Kitona Maramaki Wanganui Po, Hei Pukane Motirangi Kimu Maya. Now Tiro Pufakamena Kamana Hiatanga Kiatu, He Tu Ravi. Everybody, is a little karakia. Kia ora, thank you, Joe. Appreciated that. Um, are there any apologies? And we're not sure if um, of Paul and David they might click in during the process. Um, they've absolutely stayed on this, which is really disappointing that um, they've got such huge workloads, but uh, we do at the moment, and so I'm really looking forward to the day that we can all get our feet under the table there together, Joe. So that'd be great. Um, yeah. So yeah. I will, in the interim, though, put forward their apologies. Do I have a mover? Yep. Yeah. Robert, seconded to you. Can those all those in favour please say aye. Aye. Against, carry. Any conflicts of interest? There being none, uh, we have no public forum. Any items not on the agenda? Yeah, I'd like to raise one about the um, composition of the group here, about looking for a regional council. So I will be tabling three letters today, and then they'll, they'll be discussed at the next meeting when we are able to have everybody available. Can't we discuss it today? Pardon? Can't we discuss this today? Oh, no, because the other members of the committee need to see the correspondence. What correspondence? That I'm tabling today in relation to. So have we got a quorum here today? today? You got a quorum today? Yes, we do. So why can't we have that discussion? I just want to raise the issue about this forum, which is at the stage of having the right composition on it, and I just think the regional council should be sitting at this table. What's the latest item you want to introduce, Kerry? I'd like to have a motion brought to the table to introduce. What's the motion, Kerry? The motion is to have a regional council representative on this committee. So you want to put that motion right now without any information and without all of the, yeah, we all without the co chair able to be present. I think we've all discussed this and felt it's important. So, so that's what you want to do. You want to put it on the table without the co chair, the EWI co chair being able to be present. Yeah, and that's okay. And do I have a seconder? Not without a co chair. Thank you, Rob. I appreciate that. So the reason for tabling the information was so everybody had the information and that everybody could then consider that at the next meeting we are um, pretty sure that we'll make sure that we can get everybody around the table. And if it has to be by Zoom, then it has to be. So, and that can be in between this, the next meeting, this meeting and the next meeting? That, uh, and I'll table the letters today. And then the discussion can be on the agenda for the next agenda, but probably done. So, um, if you wouldn't mind um, providing the committee members with a copy of those letters, that would be good. And Joe, we'll get those sent to you and to the rest of the committee. Okay, thank you. Okay, Tony said he'd take Joe's. So, um, there being no items on the agenda, so any, uh, do I have minutes for confirmation? Do I have a move? I'll move. Move Tony, seconder. Yep. Thank you, Robin. Any discussion? There being none, all those in favour, please say aye. aye. And carry. So, we're now on to 2.1, uh, and I'd like to move these three resolutions around around the um, committee e representation um, on item two the recommendation on item two uh, we had an addition to that and that would you like to read that out please Tina? Uh, clause number two confirms the e representatives on the shoreline management plan committee uh, Council, uh, Governance Committee, or a delegate of their choosing. 
The amendment is for a delegate of their choosing. And uh, the rest of the resolution stands. So I've moved that. Do I have a seconder? Oh, Tony? Sure. Any discussion? There being none, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against, carry. So now we're on to 2.2 uh, or 2.3. So Eamon would like us to look at 2.3 before 2.2, but they sort of go together. Um, so we'll, we'll look at 2.3, if we need to switch back to 2.2, we may. Um, I actually felt the two, I kept referring back, frequency and Shana. Is it Shana? It's not yeah, 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 okay. That's lovely name. Um, so welcome, Shana. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Some of you will see here more than others. Um, so if we go to the 2.3, which is your shrine management plan, erosion and inundation maps. Oh, sorry, page 17, sorry. I'll, I'll have to get the here. <laughs> so, thank, thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to Sean mostly for this first item, which is on the hazard maps. Um, it really allows a bit of an understanding of the challenges we face um, when we come back and look at the scope. Um, so there's a little bit on the, um, what the hazards are, and then we want to spend just a bit of time looking at the maps themselves, so we're all fully aware of what we're, what we're dealing with. Um, Great, and, and I understand, I'm really appreciative to Tony Fox, who's been going around the coastal panels, and he said it's been really, really good, really valuable, so uh, Peter Rebel is doing a great job in that regard, so thank you, Peter. Okay, <clears throat> the reason for showing you this map, and um, anybody who's seen any of the presentations will have heard this before, or come to any of our open days, but what this is about is showing what we've taken account of when we've developed our hazard mapping. Because these maps are quite striking. You know, they, really, they really tell a big story about what could happen around this coastline. And this just provides the context. Because predicting sea level change is complicated. And it's complicated by a lot of different factors. And it won't act in isolation. In terms of coastal events, will be combined with stormwater events, groundwater increases, those sorts of things. So, what our modeling does is it does take account of a lot of those things. It makes assumptions about sea level rise and different levels of sea level rise. It also looks at uh, the effect of a storm event, wave run up and wave set up. So, there's a lot of combined factors in there to consider. And it's the same for erosion. So it's not just a matter of uh, eroding, what, what might erode when there's a storm that comes, it's also how that sort of insipid effect of sea level rise will affect the coast and will affect the profile and the long-term recession profile of the coast. So there's quite a lot of work that's gone into this and it's also gone into considering what, what the relevant storm events are for coronavirus. Because it, there are actually different storm events that are most important the West Coast as compared to the East Coast. So we've looked at both. We've looked at extra-tropical cyclone events, which are going to, or predicted to increase in their frequency as climate change occurs. And we've also looked at these you know, the traditional wind models that come up from the South and can affect the West Coast, such as the January 2018 storm. Um, so that's the context. I won't dwell on that. And what we've done um, yeah, what we've done is we had open days and we've had coastal panel meetings where we have uh, presented our hazard mapping to the public. So we're just going to make sure we're sharing the screen for um, Joe and any others online. Yeah, I've got it. You, you can see it, Joe. You can see the presentation, but I can't see it. What page? What page are you on? What are you talking about? You're on. It's on screen actually, so you may yep. not be seeing it on screen. Yeah, I see a the hazard mapping, and I've got a hard copy here as well. So. Oh right, okay. You don't have this. 
You don't have this particular presentation, John. Oh, all right. Okay. No, it's all right. We'll just listen to Sean as she yes. goes through this. It's just uh, setting the scene as I understand it. Yeah. Yeah. Would that be a fair, a fair analysis? Now, we're going to see this now. Yeah, I'm happy. Right. So this is available on your website, which is which is great, and a lot of we've had a lot of positive feedback from the Thames community, Thames Garden communities about the fact that we're making these maps available. Um, what we want to show you is first of all we have a series of coastal erosion maps, and we then have a series of coastal inundation maps. Um, the biggest effect on the peninsula is inundation by quite some margin. And what Aaron has just done is he's clicked on the map of Thames. Um, do you want to, if you can, you can zoom in a bit if you roll. So what this is showing you, blue is what we expect to flood now with a so-called one in 100 year event, so a one in 100 year storm. And there are assumptions made about the nature of that storm, the wind direction, the heights of the thing, um, whether it's a spring tide, and those sorts of things at the time that it's going to happen. But just to put it into context, the event that happened on the, in January 2018 was a so-called 200 year uh, storm. Now that doesn't mean they happen once every 100 years, as we all know. They can happen whenever they are going to happen, but it's just a, 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 it's called one percent annual exceedance probability event. It's the size of the event you're going to have. But Thames is vulnerable now to inundation from the coast uh, from a one in one hundred year event, and the blue area shows you what is predicted to flood under those circumstances and in those conditions. If you zoom out again, the Orange area is what's predicted to occur if you get half a metre of sea level rise. So in other words, in terms of the line of here, the uh, defences that are provided there will defend it up to a certain level, and then once one sea level exceeds that, then in a storm event, that will flood as well. And then the green area is what will happen if you get one metre of sea level rise, and the red area is what will happen if you get over that, so 1.3 is what we've used. And those represent, happen to represent different sea level rise scenarios that the Ministry for Environment Guidance says you need to look at. But if you sort of forget those for a minute, because those are 100 year scenarios based on whether you get a low, a low uh, climate change event or high climate change rate. Um, what, if you just think of them as levels, it's easier to think about because you can see because we don't know when half a metre of sea level rise is going to occur, if it's going to occur, and to what extent it will occur. But if it occurs, then this is what's going to happen. And this is what can happen now. And then any time from tomorrow, today, this afternoon, onwards. Now, it may just be one event at one point in time, but as time goes on, then the frequency of that happening is going to increase. So by the end of the decade, you could expect flooding like this much more frequently. It could become an annual event. Now, for me, I'm just wondering, but would it be helpful, like for me, would it be helpful to have what are the key things that lie in that blue area? For instance, yeah. is the hospital in that? Is yeah. the, are the schools in that? Are there make a public gathering space in that, uh, these yeah. offices in that. We have that. So, and so I just think when the public look at this to say, some stuff will be collateral damage, you know, it's going to go anyhow, but there are some things that they need, and they, one of them, or they all need, uh, we have a serious problem. Yeah. Problems. So I just, um, so the we, longer we're looking at won't know what other yeah. key things that sit inside those spaces. So we've just done that analysis. So we've overlaid, or we've looked at this, used GIS to analyse what is in that zone. Right. And uh, we've produced an Excel spreadsheet that says, with this event, this is what will be impacted. This is what will get wet. 
and that's available to the Coastal Panel members now. We've just made it available for them to validate the spreadsheets. It's not available. So when was the last event that did that? I don't okay. think it's happened. Right, so we haven't had an event that's flooded to that extent? No, not yet. Well, I, I recall water in Collins Street. Yeah. So, uh, you get flooding for different reasons. Because this is flooding from the sea. What Thames is also vulnerable to is flooding from the river systems, from drainage from the hills, surface water flooding and groundwater flooding. So you do get different flooding events that will cause different outcomes. But this is just from the sea, but it will combine with those other events. So Sean, that spreadsheet that you've got of all the, I guess it's assets that are in there that you put to the crystal, are you trying to lay a values filter on that as well? Because that's going to be part of the process with the coastal panels is going through and you know, what are the values and that's probably not being safe. Yeah. But when push comes to shove and that's on a list of things that we've done that you could not, that's going to change presumably when they go, oh, okay, yes, the bench access is lovely, June's great, packet safety is fantastic. You know, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So is that going to come back through the panels so, once they've seen that and the value's going to change? So in terms of the, the process, we've gone to the panels and we've, we've outlined the process in terms of the spreadsheets and we've demonstrated what the values assessment are going to give in some areas. And then we've just recently finalised that work and that's going to be made available or is available for the panels or very soon and that will inform the next dis discussion about solutions. So you've got all this, this list of hospitals or houses or, or roads um, and you've got a, a, a weighting against them that further helps, helps that discussion. Yeah, we've looked at the built environment, the natural environment, the cultural environment yeah. and something else. Why in that, so because so cobalt, another classic example, is you in terms of assets that will be affected, it doesn't in any way get to the same sort of scale of effects as you get in Thames, but it takes the heart out of the community. You, you in effect you lose cobalt. Not not now, but with half a meter of sea level rise. So you know that's a cultural, there's a cultural issue there. Um, do you want to look at this here now? So Thames, Tapuru, and Tararu have the same picture. So Tapuru and Tararu are vulnerable to flooding now. They're the southern half of those fanned outers um, could easily be flooded, and they have been flooded. So Tapuru, for example, flooded in the 2018 storm, which struck the coast a bit higher. And, and prior to that. Yep. And so um, Tararu as well. But Tararu has a bit of a stop bank. It does. Um, it does in the northern half of it, and the southern half of it's vulnerable. That's right. And you could you could mistake them for each other. The flooding maps just look the same. So in reading 2.2 and 2.3, the the what indicates to me is that there is potentially an immediacy for Tararu. Yeah. And so depending on the level of of um, risk and commitment in there. I would suggest that that be a referenced in the LTP and a submission to the LTP because that's when you trigger a potential budget line for your long term plan to cover that 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 obvious risk within Tyler. Yeah. And potentially to Purdue, but I think there's a wee bit more work to do about what could happen in Tapuru, because as you're raising in the houses or there's a moving in houses, and you know, I don't think, don't think that's quite got there yet, but Tauru set, it's got a much more, um, pop, much greater population density in there, I would have thought. But anyway, it's, yeah. just, it's yeah. just, when you talk about doing the risk, uh, do, sorry, doing the work, taking some course of action, Right now, I'd, I'd put the immediacy into the LTP. So this is Taru. So you can see, um, this is that's where it's budget defended. So you can see that that's the higher area that's above there, and this sum and a half of that is vulnerable. So the northern end, are you taking into account the flood protection works that have been done already since the last flood? Yes. So this is based on... So this will still happen even in spite of... This, our, our 
But that perhaps it could have been a, a tricky question because there was that unconsented work just in terms of the motel that was pushed up. Um, so there is uh, the lighter the information that we've got is actually prior to that fund, and it's a bit of a balance. Do do we um, take account of that flood protection works? Is it is it going to be there long term? And that there are little little bits that could be further enhanced in terms of the work we're doing. We could we could look closer at these walls and are they actually in but we're not really sure that we have to go. We've got a picture of what's happening and it's enough to guide the discussion and help us make, make solutions. So though, would you see that being needed to be put into, forwarded to council as a more immediate risk, immediate risk, therefore, and council, um, you know, um, Recommendation for a council consideration for budget. Yes, so that's I, the case. I, it needs to go on the LTP. Do, but it's all about timing. Yeah. So we're about to go and start the conversations about solutions with the panels. We don't know what the solutions are yet, yeah. so it's quite hard to put something forward when we may be deciding not to do anything in a particular area or recommending that. Okay. Mm. So just well, you haven't got oh, much time because you've got the yeah. LTP closed on the trail. Sorry, Terry. Yeah. So, so the discussion when you go back to the panels is about protecting the assets of the councils and also protecting the assets of the private individuals, or is it just council assets? But the discussion ranges from what are what are all the solutions from um, protection mm -hmm. um, through to. Um, I guess, enhanced journeys or, or non-protection. Right. Um, in terms of council assets, it's the distinction between private, private and council assets is, isn't uh, obvious. I mean, when you look at Thames, the council assets are very much in amongst the private assets. So the conversation largely is one and the same. But we still got council assets in terms of water and wastewater and stormwater infrastructure, however, from Tauru all the way to Coromandel, we don't have any. No. Oh, it's not true, actually. We've got the roads and the Kiwi Tiamming, which creates a stormwater infrastructure, but we don't have any water or waste water. Water. But in some very isolated areas, there, there are occasions where it is only private. There's three or four houses um, that don't have, there might be a road, sorry, but I can think of a couple of examples where there's not much council asset. Right. And that puts a slightly different lens yes. on it and how we might be recommending solutions. Or, okay. The only exception to that is public toilets. <laughs> so that, oh yeah, didn't get back to Batiana. So that, you can see the um, more immediate, the, there's locations where the issues are more immediate, Thames, Tukuru, Taru. But there are, as Sam just mentioned, there's different solutions that could be taken in those locations. And then you get places like Fitiana. So the impact is greatest in Thames and Fitiana around the whole of the Coromandel. We can show you from the time in a minute, but from the time is, um, it gets off very, very lightly. <laughs> Fong is going to do very well in the face of sea level rise, luckily. So but th this happens. Oh, well, it makes you say that. <laughs> it's, a, it's a place that you don't have to be concerned about. No, but I, I don't think you can ignore the confluence, though, of potential sea level rise and and um, just flooding yeah, it, it, as a consequential meeting of the waves, because that's usually how it happens. Yeah. When you get the two together, yeah, the, they're, they're, during that last weather bomb, Terry, it was at set point. 2017, we had 800 millimetres. The water had nowhere to go. Over yeah. four days. So, yeah. you know, through the chair, but I think what you're talking about, Sharp, is the elevation of from the tower yeah. is higher than the elevation of other areas. Maybe so, sea rise would have less impact, so weather will still have storm with issues in from the tower. It's sinking, though, isn't it? <laughs> kidding. I'm just <Yeah>. kidding. <laughs> That's the thing. Yeah. It's, um, I was probably inappropriately trying to do, draw the distinction between how. Thames is so low-lying, low vulnerable, and then it will flood. 
whereas this is from the time, and the red line is the projection that you have when you have over a metre of sea level rise. So because of the elevation of from the time, very little of it will become inundated from the sea. Now, there are going to be issues, as you come down the estuary, which we don't need to do now, um, of access, of flooding of the ground levels, and we also know this gets saturated. Yeah. We also know those grounds get saturated. So it's not to say there won't be issues, it's just to say that in terms of investing in, in say, defences or solutions, that you won't need to make that investment here if you can resolve the issue of access and drainage. Um, but Tiana, how do you how do you resolve the drainage if your tidal levels are of your of your mean high water mark is high and you've got maximum maximum um, water levels groundwater levels? This, this isn't looking at the solutions at the moment. This no. is looking at what the risk is. Yeah, sorry, and yes, getting an on. overall picture. Yes. And then the discussion will be about what are the options to provide solutions. So at the moment, and that's been the issue around all the meetings, people have jumped to say, that's it. when it rains or the tides die, this happens, this is how I think you can fix it. We are not there yet. We are in the space of saying, where are the risks and where do they come from? Do they come from inundation or do they come from rain and catchments? And when we understand all of that, and who's most at risk, then say, what are the options? And is that planting things? Is it sticking concrete yeah. in the ground? So this is, or is oh, it this is out out there? So first thing, as you can see, it's also uh, very much at risk, but in the longer term. Do you see risk is always in a, in a res? Yeah, the, uh, that's it's, over a meter of sea level yeah. rise. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, so, so there's a real difference, and I'll, I wanted to try and make sure it was quite clear, there's a real difference between Thames and Fidianga. Yeah. In Thames, the blue is now, and that was a big part of Thames. In Fidianga, this is the now problem, but this little bit up here. It's not until you get a half a metre of sea level rise, which takes you to the orange, another half a metre takes you to the green, another half a metre is the red. So at the moment, it's not such a problem, but looking longer term, it will be. It could be. Could be. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, so, just, so one thing I want is that we're talking about Sean just looking back to Thames, um, yeah. and obviously looking at the blue, we're saying that's the risk now, um, with no sea level rise and a one one hundred year or one percent AUP event. Yeah. But I think you mentioned that event we had in the January twenty eighteen was a like a 200 year? It was. Yeah, so, so do you want to explain and talk about, because obviously that's a 100 year event, we can see that flooding in a 200 year event, so no. I suppose that the, can be the challenge for you know, customers and ratepayers to understand what we're talking about. We say that's 100 year, yeah, we had a bigger event and we didn't have that scale of yeah. inundation, so how does that? Well, one thing that stands out for me is um, it was a 20 year wind event. Right. Um, so you had that combination of high tides and other things, but it could have easily been much worse because the wind wasn't as 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 high. So there's there's and with the statistics, there's um, things that compound the the chance of it being a high tide, the chance of the storm surge, and the chance of the wind event. Um, so I'm, I'm just kind of pointing out it could have been a lot worse. Yeah. And it's not straightforward, but I. No, exactly. I think, um, I think that's kind of my that, point, although we don't talk about, we're not talking about wind at this time, are we? Like, no, 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 we are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because um, yes, those slides I showed, where I showed you the things that we take account of, yeah. that way of setup is influenced by the, wind. by the wind. So we look at wind conditions and we look at typical storm conditions. And we, what we did is we looked at other storm events that have occurred on this coast, and if, if those wind conditions had happened, yes. So it's not. Uh, this is not going to happen, you know, regularly. This is, is an extreme event, and we're precautionary in the way we do this work because it's about planning. It's about saying right, what could happen, and what do we need to do to be ready for it. Uh, but having said that. Um, 
and I'm sure you wouldn't, but this is not something to take lightly because we didn't expect that level of uh, risk to be apparent right now. We would have expected more, more of the orange, such as you see in Botiana, for example, but not right now. And the other thing, just through the chair, is that there wasn't a lot of rain. The Karanga River where it is yeah. didn't flood and didn't push back into town, so that would have had another impact to it if that had been the case. Yeah. It's a 200, 2018 event. Yeah. yeah. And the way, it depends on the, where the storm's coming from, but the, you will all know this, but the way it was the shape of the first, that when it, in a big wind event, the, the water gets forced down, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, which didn't happen to that extent in the 2018 event. Oh, we can show you erosion lines, just for the record, I suppose. But um, as I said earlier, it's the like a beach in a beach. <laughs> um, we've also looked at this. Uh, it's the inundation that's going to have the biggest impact. You can see, in terms of erosion. Um, there are more subtleties, so you'll get big areas of certain beaches, most beaches, where there's not going to be too much of an effect because of your reserves. And in other areas, what the dotted line here means is there's a defence. So we're not saying that erosion is going to occur, but we're saying that if the defence wasn't there, or if the defence is not in good condition, um, then that's the erosion that will occur by the dotted lines. The solid lines, there are no defences. So just clarify that, that that's the green dotted line and, yeah, the, is, and the, the black one is actually our existing um, second line. Yeah, the two black lines are your, uh, the, the lines that are included in the district plan at the moment. So your current erosion line and your future erosion line. So in this case, the new work actually lines up really well with that, with those lines that you had there for a while now. There is a call to do more going South down on, on this map. Yeah, yeah, that's your south, yeah. It's probably probably right there. That's yeah. Your We're crossing that. And, and of course it's sort of round and out. Yeah. Um, but actually it's only going to the other, the edge of the other, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. And that's just to protect the boat house and the access that the boat house is. Uh, I think what what's relevant here is that the blue line is now, sorry, the purple line is now. Blue line there is erosion in 20 years. These are just predictions, and the orange line is uh, erosion in 50 years. So this, the predictions are saying it's 20 years before the boathouse is going to be affected. Uh, if you if you go through the south on this way, you, know, you can see that there are certain locations where the, the new predictions, because they're based on the current topographic and mathematical information, actually don't predict the same extent of erosion as was previously predicted because they were fine. Also, you will have had works that have been going on in certain locations. You have had defences, you have um, uh, your beach planting schemes, which are all helping to improve conditions. So, so something we've discussed with the panels really is, is when you're looking at somewhere like Fidianga, you need to consider both the, the significant hazards. So it's, it's um, a, uh, inundation as well as erosion, and is there a solution? Uh, when we come to solutions, is there a solution that takes account of both of those those challenges? So those maps. Uh, would you like to look at any other area in particular? Up to the panel, I'm comfortable. Robert, is there anywhere else that really stands out as being different um. or? Oh, oh that's that's interesting, yeah. In terms of the, the infrastructure is yeah. limited to sort of non inhabited, uh, sorry, you know, flat, your flat roading areas and your, it's not houses per se. You're looking at Cornwall. Yeah. From up to down. Oh, it's, oh, sorry, I've got it wrong. Yeah. So they get some um, Asian nodes. They on a king tide, it comes out the water comes over the road now. Mm -hmm. So that's going to happen much more frequently as time goes on. And so there will be real access issues. And that is true of the whole of that Thames Coast Road. It's, it's, cold. it's not cold. Mm -hmm. it's, it's cold. Schools somewhere in here. Oh, 
Oh, no, sorry, there's Big Bay. Yeah, sorry, there's Big Bay. Uh, it just, hang on, just hold on a bit. I'm just trying to get my beer. Oh, oh there's sure. the beach. Oh, all right, yeah, okay, yeah. Oh, you know what I'm confusing it with? You blew. You blew oh, over the land. Not, that's not water. Yeah. 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 That's land. Well, it's not land, it's entitled. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Um, no, it's easy. Oh, God. Cornwall is also in a road. Um, if you have a look at the erosion map, and we do actually have a risk map to combine the two. Um, so there's a real version for Cornwall. But. Oh, you've done a lot of tides here. <laughs> but the issue um, <laughs> is true of that whole of that West Coast road, and there's going to be. A, Access implications for all of those communities along that coastline. Very close to high tide. Yeah, which we make a point about that in our recommendations. But it's about, I mean, you've been up the area. Yeah, I've been through the Greenwich Harbour, and, and the, uh, yeah. uh, it was a king tide, but it was lapping through the Kudaka right on the road. We'll make sure we go to the boat. Yeah, go to the boat up there. Uh, uh, that's our road. That's our road. Yeah. 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 Because not the same. Not the same. No, everything yeah. north of Coromandel Town is our road. So that's why it's such a nightmare because it, the dropouts we keep getting on Port Jackson Road, etc., etc., etc. And of course, Costanama leave for resource consent to try and do any shoring up of that road in Whitwick should be a permitted activity as part of the uh, maintenance and. and Works so, so that kind of concludes that item, which I think is really useful for our next discussion. Um. Okay, so here we go. The recommendation for this item 2.3. Here we go. Just received by the mover. I'll move. Move, Tony. Second move is brought on. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Hence, carried. Thank you very much for that. So, this next item is, is a little bit about an update and a, a quite a bit about scope. Um, so, in terms of where we're at, we're, we're up to the um, vulnerability and risk. So, we've got the risk maps, and then we've got a step further to understand actually what's sitting behind the maps and, and what's important for the community. So, that's being discussed with the panels. Um, the next things are options, discussions, and then we get to adaptive strategies with um, some recommended solutions. What we don't do is implementation. So that's outside of the scope, just reinforcing or reminding us that that's, that's where we'll get to at the end of this project. We'll have a, a shoreline management plan, but we won't have built anything. Um, so that's good to recognise. Um, what we have found, and from the work we've done, um, a few obvious things, that Thames is, is vulnerable, um, for the Anger will be in the future, and these areas that we could do more work. Um, so there's, there's one option, not, not to do more work, um, to keep, keep the project at a high level, um, finish it within scope and budget, um, but there will be some things, if we did that, that as a project team, we think we probably would have missed out on. Um, the second second item is to um, increase option is to um, uh, increase the scope slot slightly, um, and we'll get to that next. The third one is to um, refocus our efforts, um, and this one's really really tricky to implement. Um, but say for the uh, Fongamata doesn't need any any work done. Let's not continue with that panel and just do the work in Thames. So that's that's what that's saying. It's not what we recommended, recommend, but we considered that given that these different different risks. Yeah, so I, I couldn't I couldn't accept that because I think it's really important that that part of the board also be included because there are things at risk and mm. even though it's got elevated ground. So my my Positioning with is that two more? No, it's not two more. I think I've personally three is probably not something we could do, and we've gone so far and now that it, it would be silly to 
not can continue on with those areas, even though they are lesser risk. So, so from my perspective, option one absolutely because I'll tell you why. Because option two, you can recommend to the council for further consideration, and that then takes care of option three within that. So, because clearly there's going to be more, more funding required for different different aspects depending on the risk relative to time frame. And that's why I mentioned before that the highest risk I think should be paid now to council in a submission to the LDB. For them to at least discuss it, consider it, and um, maybe just increase their, their um, storm budget, whatever, so that they've actually got something in standby. Yep. Tony, what do you think? No. Um, imperative that we have the money to do the work uh, to do this work. Some money to and do some work. That's right. And we also promise that there'll be some things that we can do that are for a song to help save. So that I talk about Sam push ups and planning when that work's been done. Um, and but that, that's, that's the now project. That's right. The, what, what we're looking at is the. Um, no, we should. We should go and go. Yeah. Have the whole picture. Yeah. Then we'll know priority one, priority two, and whatever and they are. Uh, and if nothing changes, then one would have to be looked at for 20 years or 100 years. But if it does change, all the work's done to be modified, and you're not standing for six up. So I just carry on doing what we're doing myself and model the whole district so that we clearly understand what is happening. And what the options are, and then what the costs are, and where do we go to get the money? Robin. Well, just looking at your resolutions on page eight, you know, it's talking about shifting the implementation, well, removing the implementation. So when does that come in? When, when do we put these solutions in place? So, so it's a before we get to that, um, so that, this is the table I wanted, wanted to go, go through. That, that it'd be really good to get some feedback on because some things um, we we might want to do earlier or later. Um, before we get there, though, just want to highlight that we have had additional. There's two two aspects. We have had additional costs relating to the modern work, and we feel that it is better use of money to divert some some of the project money we had allocated for resource consents at the end of the project um, to cover that 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 additional cost. Um, and so you look at the the. In some ways, how can you apply for a resource consent before you know what you're going to do? It, it kind of sits outside the project anyway. So that's why we think it's a so bit. What makes you think this committee is going to be applying for resource consent? It, it was uh, in the original scope of the project, and therefore we're suggesting we use the money that was tagged no, for resource consent. That's responsibility back to the council. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's that first part of that, and we, we use, use the money for modelling. The second bit is there's some more work we could do on incremental um, risks. So it's fine to know that in 100 years we've got a big risk here, but what's it going to look like in 20 years and what's what's the, the, the shorter term solution that isn't perhaps a 100 year event, but a 20 year event. So the second, second resolution rate relates to, we think we should spend some more money on the modeling but we also think we can use money that's already been allocated, um, so we don't need any more money to do that. The, the third one is this. Um, and so these are the areas we think are priorities and where um, potentially we could get some feedback. And what I'm hearing at the moment is the LTP submission could be a way to go, and these things we could cost up and, and do that if that's the feedback we get today. But these are all outside the scope of the project. Yep. So therefore they should all be referred back to the council for their consideration and direction. So whether they want those works to continue um, within this project we're going to have to fund or they need to consider those works to be carried on by council outside of the project as part of the works program. So yes. So that's what the resolution says. Um. So just thinking, as 
well. You know, you've got the two people working group and there was a discussion about the fact that you have some outside agencies involved in that technical working group. So work at the time would be part of them. And I see that they're talking about um, the one link bridge at Kauai. Mm -hmm. Is this already part of the conversation that they're having so that they can future proof the infrastructure that they're putting in there? Because the last thing we want is them to put the bridge and go, hey, none of this process is over, that bridge is not what it should be, and you need to raise it by meter. Um, yes, yeah, it's very, they're very much a part of the conversation, and they're leading us towards being more involved through the um, regional transport um, committee and potentially making submissions that way to ensure some of the, the transport resilience aspects are, are flagged early because we've, we've, we've identified them, it's appropriate to flag them and then potentially it's, it's funding from that stream to understand the best resilience options around transport and road, roading. So, what, uh, what we've got here, the number six and number eight, aren't, aren't big cost items, but they're highlighting the importance of the transport um, link and the need to work with Wakatotahi on transport. So it may be um, um, helping us prepare a, a submission to the um, Regional Transport Committee or um, working with them on, on long-term funding. So we've identified that as a as a thing to do that wasn't originally um, well scoped when we uh, started out on the project. So it's not a sea rise, it's more about flooding concerns and inland revenue. Yeah. It's more yeah, so a weather event rather than a sea rise event. So both that sits in Zealand in terms of working with Wata Kotahi. Um, when you go and look at the first three, mm. uh, they're really related to Thames. Yeah. Um, one of the things with Thames is, as you can see out the, the windows, is all the hills and three or four streams that run through there. Um, so as well as the coastal hazard, we've got um, hazards from the rivers. And so understanding how those interrelate isn't going to make those maps look any better, um, but it will inform our decision making and what options there are. Um, so that's, that's one of the items, is to better understand um, the river hazards. And there's, there's a, it's a bit of a balance because we don't exactly know how we do, will do that. Um, working with um, WRC because they have done modelling for the rivers already um, might be a cost effective way of doing it. Um, but we're we are flagging that we think we need to do work in that area. So um, on this one, I actually think we need to do a presentation to council on this as part of the LGP. Any budget monies, we need to go back to council. And in terms of what the uh, I would suggest we let, we suggest to them that we, 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 um, well, we can ask what they're doing in this space and um, we can ask if we can be kept informed or be involved. I don't think we need to be involved. It's outside the scope of this project, isn't it? It's um, not ours. Yeah, can I just say that um, that is absolutely correct, but they weren't aware of these issues and they didn't, they haven't done this work. They haven't done this modelling work, so they didn't know what the risks were and they didn't know, for example, that that Hekawai is going to be so vulnerable. And so they've actually been really pleased that TCDC has taken this initiative and is providing them with this information because they now can understand what their issues are. So it's not part of the scope of the project, but bringing them into the project has, is advantageous for TCDC. I also think, personally, that there's a funding stream here. You, so the level, what level do you want for that? Do you want the technical panel? Mm. Or, because that's really where it's at, isn't that's it? That's where that they are. So there's, yeah. there's a couple of things. You could expand your technical panel to incorporate Wakatahi. To uh, second thing you can do is you can invite Wakatahi to do a presentation to us. So or we can have a workshop with Wakatahi. So we can explore what sort of direction that, that they want to take. Because my my thinking is we give them the emphasis of leadership on this one. So that they can pay the majority of the cost. Uh, 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 uh. 
space already. So with the advent of uh, David Gregg coming on board, mm. who Bruce knows, and he's worked with Ed. Um, so they are actually in sync. So what I'm understanding at the moment is that Ed is in the process of looking at the state highway, state around this place, and where are the trunk points. So if that's Madaya, and if that's the way in those places, then you have to have a full time rain event and you can't drive through them. Mm. So one of the options, three not bridges, not anything else, they've got things now that are like egg, um, egg crates. <laughs> Ed knows all about this. So they build the roads up, meet or whatever, and the flood plane can actually move freely in and out of them, and you can drive it over them with 40 to 80 tonne, and the solution is cheap. So they're looking at that now in terms of our roading resilience. Mm -hmm. So that's going on. So when you say, would it be useful to have um, the NZTA people here? Yes, it would, so that everyone in council can know that that's happening, and then have Ed, who's doing some of that work right now. And that is stuff, and it's pop, you know, they are actively wanting to be in the space. So they can go and fix the Nile, and they can fix the way and a couple of other places and, and get government money to do that mm. and make those things for the city, and that overcomes that problem. So, so how do you want to do it? So do we I would advise you here. Okay. Um, we with them? Absolutely. Okay. But can I, can I get back to Terry? Because Terry, uh, you, we went round on, on some of this, so... Yeah, well, um, you're thinking. Yeah, I think you need the whole district involved. Very really important. If we're talking about money, money, yeah. and we, where the funding's coming from will be a discussion as well. So you're looking for a wider field or within the scope of the ratepayers to pick up this. And then, like you say, drill down on the urgent ones and uh, see where they get. But I like the idea of expanding out to look at the Hikawai and those issues, which do fall over every time there's a rain event. So, uh, yeah, I'm on board with you. The direction you're going. Excellent. So, sorry, carry on. Just realised. No, no, it's, it's, uh, it's I just realised I haven't invited Joe. I haven't been inviting any of the other. Is anyone else on apart from Joe? What do you think, Joe? Have you dropped out? Could be on mute. Yep, no, he's probably handy for the view. No, it's all right. Thanks, Peter. Okay. So, um, so probably just a couple of points on this because we haven't been through it. What, the, what, what we're saying here, um, and this is for discussion or direction, Karo and Tupuru, even though they are at risk now, are much smaller communities and we think our priority should be in tents. Um, that's, we're on the fence about that. We don't. We, if we had a bit more resource, yes, definitely we'd go and do um, those areas. But we're also conscious of not spending too much money um, or, or needing to spend too much. So um, this is all about where we go with expenditure. This is funding outside of the current project funding and scope of the project, right? <coughs> So on that basis, that's why I'm suggesting we take all this to the council as part of the long-term program and indicate what you see as the priorities. Yep. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, I, we need to know some of the proposed solutions. You, know, you, you can put it all around teams, $170 million, but is that going to fix it? Is the water around the hill going to stop it? And we need to have those I, those proposed solutions put up there to consider how effective they'll be and who it's going to protect and who it's not going to protect. It'll be part of the discussion the for council. Not yet. We're not there yet. No, we're not there yet. But that's down the line of stuff when we talk yeah. about. That's yes. But that, that'll, that's the sort of thing, though, that we go, that'll be part of this discussion on the LTP theory with council. Yeah. Because of the, this budget. Here doesn't doesn't do no, that detail. Doesn't do it. No. So, so what would potentially go back through the LTP for is some additional money to do the technical work to, to understand things. We won't be asking for the money to protect certain areas because we haven't got to that understanding or, or know what the solution should be yet. But that money may not be ours. Mm. I just keep the, the big picture in my head. 
do the work, understand what the issues are, then understand what the solutions are and what do they cost. Because I tell you, they're going to be outside of 30,000 ratepayers to fund. Yeah. But now you can go to Wellington and say, well, we've done a lot of work, and if you want to save this place, this is how much. So, government, where is your money? We are not going to be able to do it, I tell you. We, can, right. we cannot do tens to, to Peru at 187 million, because mm. that is eight kilometres of our coastline. We cannot do it. Except what we can do is look at where we can go. Agreed. And, okay. and that's what we're yes. doing right now Absolutely. in terms of uh, where we can go, and that's our adaptation. Yep. That's the other option. Agreed. Okay. Um, so I think we've covered, covered that already. Um, the last slide just highlighting a, a few dates, um, meetings that are coming up. Um, probably skipped over it a, a little bit in terms of iwi, iwi and um, coming onto the panels or the, the desire from the wider community or, or more specifically the coastal panels is to have e iwi involvement in that local level and we haven't quite got there. Perhaps with the exception of when we went to Kennedy Bay and we presented at um, Marae and that was really a good, good engagement. Um, but we think we need to put more effort somehow in, in terms of that engagement. Um, we don't don't think it's quite worth it. Hang on, just through that. Is there a desire at Joe's level and them to do this, or would they like to stay in the higher level of the discussion and that's where they want to be? Well, I would like to be at the higher level of discussion at this time. I mean, it's still, it's, we're all still getting our feet under the table, I think, aren't we, Joe? Yes, we are. Yeah. Yes. yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sort of, Tony, I'm sort of with you on this in terms of scoping this out and that. And, um, you know, it's interesting to hear two hazards from the rivers. Uh, you know, we're looking from mountains back to the sea as well, from sea going to the mountains. So, uh, I, I see a, I mean, this is Christchurch without the earthquakes, isn't it? So it, it's, it's, it's big stuff. And, and you're absolutely right, Tony, at some stage, we've got to go to the Crown to fund, to fund something as, as enormous as this. Because it's better to go to the Crown rather than the insurance companies started and waved their flags, so that put pressure on the ratepayers. So, and, and that's huge stuff too. I mean, I mean the kickback from that, and, and we, you know, the the current mayor is going to cop it from all the future mayors. So uh, <laughs> just saying, just and saying. Council makes a decision yeah. to take a case for the government, then yeah. then we can do that. I think so. I think yeah. so. Yeah. It, it won't be for lack of trying, Joe. Yeah, I know. I mean, <laughs> only do the best we can and um uh you know taking on board this list um this list here that um is put up i mean you know um yeah i mean we could all we could all be quite biased and and and, and back our own little you know our own little patches but uh uh i think i think it's all quite serious and um most uh, of it's in your patch anyway. <laughs> so that's probably all I've got to say at this stage, you know, without without um, speaking on behalf of David and Paul and, and the others, but um, as an EWI rep. So, but uh, definitely at the high level at this stage before we go out to the Marae, I uh, think. Yeah. Trying to get to some solutions so we can take solutions to the Marae mm. and uh, get their backing, get the mandate of the people. So. What what do you think, Joe? Though of the suggestion that we need to take this to council. This is the uh, recommended investigations because mm. there there are budget items outside the scope of the current project and would require additional funding. Yep. So my suggestion is we take it to the LTP yep. and and have a little call it all with the council over what the priorities might be that uh, we might need to 
indicate some budget for while we go cap in hand to the government with Tony. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think an uh, we need to explore um, what funding avenues we have uh, currently on the peninsula, which is primarily probably through TCDC and um, and uh, of course the other rating regime we have with Waikato Regional Council. Um, I, I was, you know, definitely when, when when the topic of hazards from the rivers was brought up, that sits in their in their domain. So and and just just also just just um, thinking well. They haven't had a, you know, the, the only, um, uh, it's probably a council decision that has to be made here. Um, Sandra has to go back to council is, is they need to discuss amongst themselves. Well, because there's a, there's um, the comment or li liaison committees of two, was up nearly two years ago. Have, have most yeah. of them have shut down except for the, for the uh, Waiho Piako uh, committee. So uh, it'd be interesting to see where all that money is going. Uh, to to, prop, to perhaps um, uh, fund into this stuff as well because it fits, you know, it, it, it fits the criteria um, just as a suggestion, but that needs to come out of council and uh, they need to make, uh, meet with them and make a decision on that. Um, as a suggestion, I, I, I just um, just wonder where uh, I just wonder where that funding sits with them at the moment. It could probably help considerably towards some of these um, these areas, um, and and I mean we just 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 have to do some sort of a a real exhaustive search of what we can do before we, you know we don't want to impact our rate pay yeah you know, we don't want to we don't want to put any more on our rate payers as it is um, if we can find that within our own budgets and what have you uh, before we go to the you know as Tony suggested go, going to the crown and. Um, because uh, it's serious stuff. I mean, this is the holiday peninsula between Auckland and you know, you know all the demogra demographics around um, the tourism and everything else. I mean, it's serious stuff. And um, you know, I've got a list of other horrible, horrifying uh, concerns. And I'm just wondering too, uh, um, you know, how confidential is this information? Because if the insurance companies get hold of this. They're going to have a hell of a field day with, with this stuff. Well, yeah. this is not and, it's, and it's going to directly affect the uh, rate payer and, you know, rental properties and all that. It's just going to, you know, I mean, pretty young is ex expensive enough now, um, you know, with targeted rates and all sort of thing to try and address this problem. I'm just wondering where it's all going to go. Uh, we'll that's go to that's, that's my two cents place. worth. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's not confidential, Joe. This yeah. is public information. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Tony. So I think I mentioned our council meeting the other day, Joe. But they, we had a very good presentation from a independent lady on insurance, but she did work for the biggest insurer in New Zealand, the ARG. She was brought on to look after Christchurch and some of the had there. They are very well, and I've just said, yeah, we're saying in 18 months' time, yeah. something might happen. But they've just said one more major weather event. Yeah. There is no money left in insurance. Christchurch flattened it. Yeah. Yeah. Kaikoura took one step over, and one in Red Woodville. Yeah. The major insurers leave New Zealand. Right. So it's coming to the stage where properties in the line of this danger will either become uninsurable or they'll end up with 15 dollars 15 percent excess of some so the insurance council right now are in this and um yeah we better be ready for it and uh, we better have people in our coastal communities ready for it because that is usually a driver we need to sit here understanding it and how we're going to resolve it and then who's going to give us the money to help because otherwise yeah. Um, there will be a lot of people and, and uninsured. So, yeah. So, that was another presentation, uh, Sandra, I thought was worthy of bringing to council is that the same lady come and tell us that what's going on in the big world of insurance and particularly how it affects the potential private industry. So, right. do you want to do that for this group or do you want to do that at council? Um, 
So what does is, what is the meeting feel? Would a presentation by an insurance? By this insurance? I think we should be familiar with it, it's really up to date. If you've heard to be told, it's information we should really understand. Because if we take a risk here, which is a big one, next year, there could be a 100 year event here, couldn't it? Mm, and yes. we haven't got the money to do it. So we're in crap street straight away, aren't we? <laughs> How we deal with it. So we don't know when it's going to happen, do we? You can't say it's going to happen in three years or five years or two years. So there's a whole lot of vulnerability and risk going on here. And the more we get deep into it, the more we're likely to be seen as you are the fixer. What are you going to do to fix it? That's the drama that I feel about this. Well, can I add something to that? One good point, Melissa, this, this lady makes is she paints this picture of disaster. <laughs> But she also makes the point very strongly that, that this is a good project and that TCDC's initiative is very positive in the context of going yeah. forward with the insurance sector. It'd be a good project, it'd be a great project, it would happen in 20 years, wouldn't it? It'd be a fantastic project. But if it happens earlier than that, it's going to be a very expensive project. They're all commending, I would say, all the to insurance and as you turn, this council for this project. I think it's very useful for this group to understand the insurance picture. Yeah. Because not everyone on this group is on council. Yeah. I think very useful for the councillors to understand that there's work going on this and in their respective communities that they, that they represent. This is what's coming down the line. Yeah. So they can understand what this is about. Think about if they're not engaged now, get seriously engaged because the biggest thing that anyone on this council is going to face and do. It's going to be this project. Bigger than anything else, I've got a problem. Okay, so we've got some recommendations. I'm going to add to those recommendations. So um, the last one is item four consider the budget implications of the actions recommended for progress and yep. pro uh, considered by the SM program and presented, presented to council for further consideration, <coughs> which is in line with my thinking, but we need to do that sooner rather than later because of the closure of the LTP, or we just do a submission. And provide the information in the submission to the LTP to initiate that discussion. So at least the council have that information for the consideration for budget lines going forward. So that so I think I think in there um, might add um, and do a submission to the LTP. Provide and provide a submission to the LTP. Oh, we want both. So it's and provide a submission to the LTP. So you want to do both? Do, so the LTP is more imperative because of the time frame, but the actual discussion with council, I think, needs to be a better and longer a workshop thing, really. Yeah. Um, Second, so, and then the fifth recommendation is from Terry and Tony, if, got, if you're um, up for it, is that we have a workshop inviting Wapatangi and the insurance company. Both mm around -hmm. Do the both on the same day and it'd be one meeting. Are you happy with that? Yeah, I am. The lady, uh, Melissa, who is uh, an independent. Uh, so she isn't the insurance council, but I would suggest that we use her because her presentation is very, very like it is very, very good. People will sit here, no one will interrupt her. She is an exceptional presenter, and um, then if we need to go and get the official line from the insurance council, it'll be there once we understand what the issue is. So she, yeah, she's very, very good. So how does that sound to you, Joe? Pretty good? Yeah, yeah, that's good. I like that. So are you all, everybody happy with that suggestion? Amon and Sean? Yep. Yeah. So just take a head around the submission. Who would do the submission? Well, um, probably it'll be Amon. Okay. So you, you just put, basically it's that round about this. Yeah, yeah. But he'll flag a couple of items for more immediate budget consideration. It won't be the law. He'll, he'll present this to give a picture, overall picture to council, which us four will have an advantage in. But um, so through the chair, might be like on behalf of this committee. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. The solution is online. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's a cap, it'll be a bit of a cap and paste. Yeah. yeah. And then it gives rise to us being able to discuss it and put some funding aside. Well. Yeah. If that's the will of the decision of council. Are you happy with that? Yeah, it's, it's better to have it through that mechanism, I think. Yeah. Okay, great. <coughs> um, so I'm now going to put the resolution. You've got the fifth one, which is staff to arrange a workshop excellent and the rest follows with Swaka to our Katahi and insurance, yeah. insurance representative. Um, I can get for Shara on that comment. Yeah, that's what they do. So, if everybody's happy with that, can I have a move on? Hello. Do I have a seconder? You seconding that, Joe? Yeah, I'll second it. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, he's formerly a member. <laughs> well, we moved the representation. Okay, so to make this woman feel incredibly comfortable, you. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to cause any stress here. She would just like it confirmed that Mr. Joe Davis and Mr. John Linstead are uh, as EWI representatives on the Shoreline Management Plan Committee of Council. Governance committee or delegate for choosing. Um, so I'll move that anyway instead of doing the amendment. And the other one was confirms the EU representatives on each of the four coastal panels. You want us to do that? Both those two? Is that yeah. There was just some question over that. So move, Tony. Second it. I'll second that. Any further discussion? It's about confirming the EU stuff. So we can't leave that off. We don't need to name the EWI representatives on Kakao. We are in this instance but, uh, because they can do a delegate. Yeah. So is everybody happy about that? Yeah. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against, carry. Awesome. Actually, yeah, no, that was that was good. It was just tying up something that Jenny wanted to have in terms of the EWI representation. Right now, did we finish off that one for 2.2? We did. That was all ticking boom. And so I think, is there any other general business or members' reports that you'd like to hear? Tony, you think? Oh, well, for my members' report, I just, um, and I mentioned to the council, is to acknowledge the work that's actually going on and The commitment of these communities. So I've watched this engagement from day one, yeah. where we all found it, because no one really quite understood what's going on, because the project's so big. And it's slowly coming a bit, in a, in a bit, to where now people see a map of their area and the commentary that uh, Angela and Chicago provided with that, and the willingness of these groups to engage in it. And, the most positive group that I've actually had um, any involvement with. So they are all in the space and away doing detailed work in their own areas with the inundation and other stuff and reporting back in a, in a positive and constructive manner. So I think now, for us, uh, the rubber is starting at the road. It yeah. feels that way. Yeah. And people are sort of accepting of this process now and understanding it. And what I'm saying, you know, so, you know, I'm very, very buoyed by it, and um, I'm just, I thank all the people that have been involved. And my words to council: if you see one of these CCP meetings and you have nothing on, by all means, dial in and have a listen, because um, I think you'll spend an hour if you want it and think, yeah, there's a lot of work going on here, and some really great people. So I can't, yeah, I can't speak high enough of that, and I'm personally buoyed by it. So I just say thanks to everyone. Me. Joe, did you want anything? Do you want to report anything? Uh, no, just, just just to just to reiterate the. Um, I think it's really they're really important discussions. It's a big issue. 
we've now taken it from back of mind to front of mind for, for and i think you're absolutely right tony um i know people out there totally understand this whole um uh, what's going on out there in the environment um i, I say we don't know when this, these events are going to happen but at least tcdc can say well we we've um uh it's it's being discussed it's in it's on the agenda it's being um we're trying to find solutions at least that's all there on record and um because they you know these these huge events um uh, beyond our control really so the best we can do is is try and um um at least you know uh, through public opinion at least at least i think we'll get support uh, for um, uh, trying to do something about this problem. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gilda, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Terry. Oh, yeah, I just agree with the discussion being held. You know, our coast is very lacking of resilience. It has uh, issues all the time with the roading and um, flooding, and it's something we've lived with a long time. But as this uh, this new ideal coming through about sea rise, it put, puts a bit of you know, fear in people's eyes. And there will be a lot of push from those in areas who are feeling that they wanted their share of it. So it will be, you know, teams might want their bit, but the others will want their area as well. So you'll have to have that discussion going around with the panels and feel their, their attention. Um, but, yeah, like Joe says, it's, uh, we're doing it and we're trying to put our best foot forward. Um, it's not an easy fix, let me tell you. I can't see it's an easy fix, but we just have so a plan in place and see where it goes. Very good, thank you. Robin? I um, really just wanted to give you guys a shout out for those um, open days. It was really nice to go along to the open days and see so many people engaged in the process. Um, especially, you know, to see people who were younger at those days, which was, was really nice. Well, 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 thank you for that. And I, I don't know if there are any more opportunities for that public engagement, but it would be really great to have those like you did so that we get we keep on getting that feedback from our community. Yep. From my perspective, it's great to actually hear that feedback from you, Robin, and from Tony about those coastal panels and working so well from a local's perspective. The locals really getting out there and having their say, which is what you know we really support and wholeheartedly from right from the get go. Uh, and I think it's awesome. Just like to thank you and Shit um, Sean and Amon. And, and you too, Bruce, for the. And you too, of course, Tim. Okay, for the Zoom. Um, and and it, this is a fledgling start, also. It's a big one, actually, um, to start a co governance arrangement with. But, um, and that's, that's still a work in progress as we, as we work out just the logistics of engagement in that space. So, um, I can't wait for when we're all together. <laughs> I think it's good. So thank you so much, everyone, for the next instalment. And yes, definitely tap in hand to government because the Thames Primandal District ratepayers are the same as the Waikato Regional Council ratepayers. So I'm definitely in the space of going to government. <laughs> thank you very much, everybody. So I'll move the um, acceptance of those last comments. Do I have a seconder, Robin? Well, that's the favourite because they are. Right. Yes, Carrie. Thank you, everyone. That concludes today's meeting. Very good. Thank you. Hey.